Hello everyone and welcome back to Coffee Break Archaeology and the Where Am I podcast episode 9, the podcast where we explore the world virtually because we cannot do so physically at this time. So thank you again for tuning in to a new episode. Um, in the new format that I laid out last week, um, yeah, that wasn't particularly realistic either. You know, when I was originally started doing this podcast, I had these very grand ideas of doing, you know, short podcasts maybe every day, then slightly longer podcasts maybe three times a week, but that is just not, with everything else which is going on at the moment, it's just not a realistic um, time frame with the research and the other stuff just for this podcast, but also with other stuff and other projects I'm also working on. However, I still like to keep to that idea of something Monday, something Wednesday, something Friday, and maybe something Sunday with this new format. So the new format that I am proposing is I will do one new podcast episode each week, but on each of those other days, I will give more clues to where I am uh, for the next episode. This will allow me to uh, release some information or potentially more information about the site without saying necessarily where it is um, than I would necessarily be able to put into the episode. And it, uh, I guess, creates hopefully a bit more of a guessing game and hopefully you guys might engage with it a little bit more as well. So that is going to be the format for the Where My Podcast going forward. New episode every Monday with a series of clues scattered throughout the week, probably uh, Wednesday, Friday, and then on a Saturday or Sunday, depending on what my weekends are like. These may include my own artistic interpretation drawings, or they may include, like I did with the original podcast, aerial views or photos of the site or pictures of the site, and also um, maybe text descriptions or some little facts or factoids about the site. So again, you'll be able to see those on probably Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook, or probably on all three. Um, so that is how this podcast is going to go going forward. So, <clears throat> moving on. In our last episode, we were at Scarbray in Orkney. And uh, in, that e- in that episode, I gave sort of potentially sneaky clues to where we would be today in today's episode. The other clues I also gave you was I was at a site uh, which had a very famous uh, roof box and is probably um, one of the best known passage tombs in the Boyne Valley in Ireland. Uh, So again, if you didn't see that episode or you're just hearing these clues for the first time, like always, I'll just give you a couple of moments to mull those over, see if you can guess where I am. Of course, you could also just pause the video. Okay, then that's probably long enough. And of course, I am at Newgrange in County Meath in Ireland in the Boyne Valley. So uh, Newgrange is again one of those sites which I didn't really know a lot about, I guess, until I really started doing my uh, A-level archaeology projects and I guess also again into university. Um, My uh, college lecture was a very big fan of Newgrange although not very much a big fan of its reconstruction, but we'll get onto that and the uh, sort of controversy uh, regarding that uh, in the episode. So what is Newgrange? Well, Newgrange is a Neolithic monument, uh, which, as I said previously, was in uh, County Meath in Ireland in the Boyne Valley, on the north side of the river Boyne, in fact. The site itself mainly consists of a large mound which is built of alternating layers of earth and stones with grass growing over the top of what is now the reconstructed facade with white quartz stones studded uh, with intervals of large rounded cobbles covering part of the front circumference. So that is how it looks now and I do say that because that is something that is very important to remember. The mound is around about 76 metres across and 12 metres in height and covers uh, an area of around 4,500 square metres or around about 1.1 acres. Within the mound itself there is a chambered passageway 
uh, which is accessed through an entrance on its southeastern side and that passageway stretches for around about 19 meters or about a third of the way into the center of the structure. At the end of that passageway there are three small chambers off a larger central cha cha chamber which has a high corbelled roof. Each of the smaller chambers has a large flat basin of stone where the bones of the dead may have been deposited uh, during prehistoric times, maybe as part of a initial ritual and then later moved elsewhere within the chamber. We don't really know, but there are three basins within that chamber. So the walls of the passage are made up of large stone slabs, 22 of which are on the western side and 21 on the eastern side, and they average around about one and a half meters in height. And many of these uh, stones are also decorated with uh, carvings and as well as later graffiti during various uh, plunders of the tomb and other um, excursions into it. Situated around the perimeter of the mound there are a series of uh, well a circle of standing stones. Twelve standing stones survive currently out of possibly maybe an original 35 or 37 or somewhere along those lines. Um, however, these are unlikely part of the um, original monument and probably were added later during the Bronze Age occupation of the site along with uh, nearby timber circles. So probably one of the most famous features of uh, New Grange, well there's two that, you could probably, uh, that we can probably talk about. First of all, we'll talk about the sort of large array of engravings or artwork which have been found within the New Grange site. Now New Grange consists, contains various examples of Neolithic, Neolithic rock art. Um, these carvings fit roughly into 10 different categories, five of which are what we call curvy linear um, carvings which are circles, spirals, arcs, serpentine forms and what we call dot in circles. And the other five are rectilinear, so chevrons, lozenges, radials, parallel lines and offsets. These engravings are sort of marked by a wide different styles in the way which they are sort of carved and how they're laid out throughout uh, the tomb. The most notable of these engravings are probably the Triskelly uh, engravings which are a series of interlocking um, spirals or circles such as the ones that can be seen on the large entrance stone, a stone that is often referred to as probably the most famous stone in the entirety of megalithic art. Now it's believed that most of probably the carvings at, at Newgrange uh, were produced prior to the stones being erected, although the entrance stone, it is believed that this was actually carved in situ uh, before the curved stones were placed alongside it. And some of these engravings um, appear in some quite unusual places. A lot of them are sort of on the curb stone, some of them appear on the ceilings, but some of them um, also appear sort of on the underside of some of the curb stones, on the bit of the stone as it, which would go into the earth. Now, originally, the um, archaeologist George uh, Coffey, or Coffey, who uh, excavated the site in the 1890s, or investigated the site in the 1890s, believed that these uh, engravings uh, had a purely uh, decorative purpose. Uh, but now, a lot of archaeologists, um, such as Michael Kelly, who did the excavations throughout the 60s and 70s, believe that these probably had a symbolic nature, because you wouldn't put something which was purely decorative on the underside of a stone slab which would never necessarily be seen. So they do believe it may have, these stones were invoking their symbolic or, or ritual 
purpose of some kind. The second uh, most famous feature probably of Newgrange is the so-called uh, roof box which sits above the doorway which on the sunrise of the winter solstice as the sun rises up a uh, the sunlight slowly lights up the passage as it goes into the back passage and illuminates the back passage um, there is obviously a lot of speculation about what that and what that might symbolize but we will not get that into that here because we could be here for quite a long time just discussing that itself but again i'll put some further information regarding that in the um, description below so let's now move on to the construction of the tomb the burials in the tomb and the potential purpose of New Grange. Well, as previously mentioned, it is a Neolithic. Uh, it is a Neolithic monument. It is a uh, passage grave, and there's a bit of, uh, like with all these sites, you know, there's a bit of um, contention potentially around the exact date, but most people agree it was built around about 3,200 to 3,000 BC. And again, often when you see Newgrange talked about, uh, they often compare it to being older than Giza and Stonehenge. Now, I always hate this comparison when people, especially with Stonehenge, uh, compare it to being older than Stonehenge. Obviously, it is a easy comparison to make, as lots of people have heard of Stonehenge, they've heard of Giza. The issue of sites like Stonehenge and, to a certain extent, Newgrange, is when you talk about them being older, you're talking about what point in time you're talking about because Newgrange was built over a period of time, Stonehenge was certainly built over a period of time, over a very long period, and people tend to see it as one monument rather than a series of monuments or monument which is in constant flux as Stonehenge and other sites were. You know, they didn't just stay as as we think of them now or as people see reconstructions of Stonehenge and think that's what it looked like for all of its life when it was being used. Now certainly as Newgrange looks today it looks very different to potentially how it would have looked in the Neolithic. This is due to the reconstructed facade at the front which I'll get on to later. But when it was built at that period of around about 3000 BC They think it may have taken somewhere between 5 to 30 years to build. Archaeologists can't uh, agree on uh, the exact dates. And the reason for that is just, even though you know it is much bigger now than it potentially would have looked like in an Neolithic, it is still a very large tomb. There are around about 547 slabs which make up the inner passage alone. Um, there was around about 200,000 tons of pebbles uh, which make up the exterior of the tomb and lots of these came from anywhere between five kilometers away up to maybe 50 kilometers away um, the slab stones that is not so much the pebble stones the pebble stones were all sort of sourced locally from the river terraces near the Boyne whereas some of these much larger curb stones came from um, the uh, Cooley Mountains, um, but some of the uh, cobblestones also came from the Wicklow Mountains, which is quite far away as well, the dark cobblestones. Now there is argument with these cobblestones, whether they adorned the front like they do now, or they indeed formed sort of an apron um, sort of around the tomb like uh, has been um, shown at the reconstructed tomb of Nauf, not too far away. But again, it's not, uh, it, we, we don't really know. Certainly there was a certain amount of stones used in the front, but after that we don't really know necessarily how it would have looked. So during the excavations, 
um, both burnt and unburnt human bone were found in the passage indicating that human corpses were placed within it at some point some of which may have been cremated now we do know that cremations did not happen within the tomb uh, when the tomb was excavated there's no evidence of smoke or burning within the tomb so they would have been cremated prior to being interned in in the tomb and from looking at the unburnt bone it is shown to have come from probably at least two separate individuals but quite a lot of the skeletons were missing and what was had what what was present had been scattered throughout the passage now this is likely due to um various plunderings of the tomb over its life and unfortunately disturbed quite a lot of the buried remains there may have been a lot more uh bone evidence which may have been either taken away or crushed or destroyed somehow. There's also a variety of grave goods which were found uh, deposited alongside the bodies inside the passage. Um, the excavations in the 60s and 70s revealed uh, seven marble-like uh, artefacts, four pendants, two beads and uh, flint tools, bone chisels and fragment of bone pins and points like the ones we discussed in last week's episode looking at Scarva Bray and how these these bone points are very similar to the ones which were found at New Grange and how that may indicate um, prehistoric trade between Ireland and Scotland at some point or certainly a, an interchange of ideas and objects potentially maybe even people there also uh, remains of animals were found within the structure, primi primarily those of uh, mountain hares, rabbits, dogs, but there also was the occasional bat, there's evidence of sheep, goats, some cattle, song thrushes, and uh, more rarely mollusks and frogs. Most of these animals would have entered and died in the chamber many centuries or even millennia after it was actually constructed. Um, for instance, you know, rabbits were only introduced into Ireland in about the 13th century. Now, these sort of during the Neolithic period, the sort of New Grange area continued to be the focus of quite a lot of ceremonial activity, that such as the erections of other passage graves. But during the late Neolithic, it appears that New Grange had started to fall out of use. There doesn't appear to be any artefacts associated with the late Neolithic or New Grange being used to bury the dead. Although, as we said, some of this may no longer be evident due to later tomb plunderings. But, you know, people in the Bronze Age were still using uh, the area timber circles were erected nearby, the outer um, megalithic stone circle around New Grange was probably erected during the Neolithic, and we certainly know that New Grange was also a site that was at least still visited, what significance it had we didn't know, into the Iron Age, um, as there was various iron objects such as pendants uh, made from gold which were deposited near the site and including even some Roman coins um, ranging between 320 and 337 AD and some Roman jewellery, uh, bracelets, rings, necklaces and so forth. So now that sort of brings us up, what was the purpose of Newgrange? Now this is always a very difficult uh, Thing to explore without rambling on for too much so we're going to look very briefly at what people have talked about the purpose of New Grange was. Now it obviously has some form of uh, ritual significance potentially as a place of worship for the cult of the dead or an astronomical based faith. This, this is a a feeling that people appear to associate a lot with Neolithic sites and certainly at other tombs and even into the late Neolithic early Bronze Age. 
Um, so this again brings us back onto the roof box again with this idea of this astronomical cult. Uh, at the winter solstice, the rising sun does directly does shine directly along the passage, illuminating the inner chamber, revealing the carvings, including the triple spirals on the front walls and ceilings of the chamber. This illumination lasts for around 17 minutes. And this was first observed actually by Michael O'Kelly, who carried out the 1960s and 70s excavations on the 21st of December 1967. The sunlight enters the passage uh, through the roof box, which is directly above the main entrance, and as you say, directly um, shines through and illuminates the light of the back passage. And although so, so alignments are not uncommon among passage graves such as uh, New Grange, the idea of this roof box is very, very rare. And it's very unlikely that having this roof box position and this alignment was purely by accident, whereas, you know, with some tombs, maybe the, the, the alignments were potentially more coincidental. Um, such as potentially as at Dalf or Maze Howe, where it, it, they're not as precise, shall we say. That's probably the best way of phrasing it. So what does this potential um, alignment mean? Well, again, many have suggested that is potentially to do with rebirth and relife of potential ancestors or some link to the afterlife, the ancestors come in among us. Again, it's something which is very difficult to decipher and again one could go into quite a lot of different theories around this so again I'll put some more information in the description for you to go and make your own mind up about the potential purpose of the roof box. So the looking sort of at it at its later history during the medieval period, New Grange and the wider Boone Boyne or the, the, the um, tombs of the Boyne Valley gained various, I guess, notori notoriety in folklore, often connected with wider Irish uh, mythology. Um, again, don't want to get into this too much, but this is sort of linked to abode with the supernatural uh, Tuatha De Dan Nan or where it might have been the burial re burial mounds for the ancient kings of Tara again don't want to get into too much but it is a site that was certainly known about and potentially was very important during the medieval period and sort of the early modern areas, people were still very much aware of the site, which unfortunately led to plundering, as previously mentioned, but also to, you know, later excavations and sort of other antiquarian studies. Again, not going to go into much detail here, but various studies uh, really from the sort of 17th through to modern times have been carried out at Stonehenge, uh, detailed surveys, small scale digging, but unfortunately also the looting of the tomb, including in 1699 by one of the local landowners, Charles Campbell, sorry, Campbell site, who uh, wanted, who was interested in some of the stones uh, at uh, Newgrange and had a few of them extracted. So that sort of brings us on to the modern time 
and the restoration and reconstruction of the tomb that took place after O'Kelly's excavations in the 60s and 70s. And this brings us on to the controversial um, work on the reconstruction of the front of the tomb. Now, the reason why this is controversial is that the reconstruction at the front isn't actually based on any ever it's not based to represent how it would have originally looked during the Neolithic and has been purely put there to facilitate access for visitors to come in to the tomb. And again, this has caused a little bit of controversy. It is the actual um, outside retaining wall which has been used to also stop the tomb from collapsing as it had started to over the years, especially with various plunderings and stones being removed. But the retaining wall is near vertical with steel reinforced concrete. And many critics of these include Neil Oliver, who has described the reconstruction as a bit brutal, a bit overdone, and kind of like a Stalin does for Stone Age. Um, critics have also gone on to say that the uh, technology to have this near vertical retaining wall did not exist during the Neolithic and you know it, it just couldn't be done and this idea that maybe these cobbles and courts, big courts clumps instead formed more of an apron around the wall or used to form some kind of courtyard. So again, this is very controversial. Um, and the reason why it's also quite controversial is that in one of the um, New Grange uh, tour guides shows the modern facade being used by Neolithic people in an interpretive description of how New Grange may have been used. Um, <coughs> which is, of course, rather misleading about how it would have looked. Um, the conservative me is also sort of alarm bells ring for me there as well as a conservator because again you are changing an object a site can still be an object um, beyond what it would have looked and even though it is to facilitate visitor access was there a better way to do that could that have been done better what are your thoughts please feel free to comment below if you think that, do you think it's good that they've done that? Do you think they could have done it better? Do you think they should have left it alone and built a reconstruction somewhere else? Or uh, done something different with the site? So again, that kind of really brings us to the end of our look at New Grange. Again, so much more could uh, be said on the matter um, at at New Grange, there's a lot of information out there. Again, more links will be in the description for you. So that brings us on to where I will be in next week's episode. I'll give you your first few clues today, and then I'll release further clues throughout the week on Wednesday, Friday, and at some point over the weekend. So again, do check out my Facebook, um, my Facebook page, Coffee Break Archaeology. You can follow me on Twitter at Coffee Break Archaeology or at Coffee underscore Arc or on Instagram, Coffee Break Archaeology Instagram as well. And I will release those clues there. So, where I'll be next week? Well, this site is the only uh, Neolithic flint mine uh, which is open to the public I believe <clears throat> one could describe it as grimy and it is a site in Norfolk England um, approximately around about eight kilometers or five, five miles northeast of Brandon in Suffolk in east of England so there we go. I mean, a, neat, a large Neolithic flint mine, one of the only ones 
I believe, which is open to the public in the UK, and you could describe this place as grimy. Again, I will release uh, some more clues uh, throughout uh, throughout the week uh, for you to decipher and for you to guess where the subject of next Monday's episode of Where Am I uh, will be located. Obviously, virtually, not actually. But again, I'd just like to thank you for tuning into this episode about New Grange. I hope you all have a very good week and until next time take care